Yanandana Shalakaya Chaktur Militanyena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shremati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Desha Tarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we are uh, studying Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, and today we are on chapter number 13, Dhritarashtra Quits Home, and this is for at the level of Bhakti by Bhav, right? So, chapter 13, let me open the PowerPoint. Oh, wait, I have to... I have to do this thing, right? Okay, everyone can see? Is it all right? Okay, good. Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Okay, Unit 4, Cantos 1, Chapter 10 to 13. Today we're on the last chapter. This is the last class of this unit. What we studied yesterday what we heard about yesterday, Parikshit in the womb. We heard Parikshit Maharaj was in the womb. We were all in the womb originally, previously. We've all been in the womb. So Parikshit was in the womb and he was protected by the Lord. So he's known as Vishnu Rata. One who is protected by the Lord. And we spoke a little bit about Vedic astronomy in the practice of Krishna consciousness. But Vedic astronomy is a great science. It should be used properly. It's material science. It's not a spiritual science, but it's material science. And by proper use of astronomy, then people can understand more about their, about the nature of a, a child or for a marriage. It can also guide. Some people use it for business purposes, which is not really what it's meant for. Then there's a big section on the qualities of Maharaj Parikshit, his wonderful qualities. He's a great Kshatriya, a great hero, a great king, a great ruler, a great controller, a great manager, a great leader. And at the end we heard about Maharaj Yudhisthira's performing three horse sacrifices, his purpose being to for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord and also to help remove some of the sinful reactions which he was carrying from the deaths of so many people during the battle of Kurukshetra. And then we went on to this chapter, chapter 13, and we heard in the, in the beginning it describes about Vidura's history, how he's actually Yamaraj and he's come due to being cursed by Mandukamuni, and he's come 
in the from the womb of a sudra, and he takes advantage to go and visit the holy places and to associate with sadhus. And he got the association of Uddhava, and then Uddhava sent him to Maitreya, and Maitreya instructed him in everything he had learned from the Lord, because both Uddhava and Maitreya had been present just before the departure of Lord Krishna from this world. And we spoke a little bit, we tried to understand a little bit about his compensate to be an acharya. But Vidura was renounced, he was detached, he'd been travelling in the holy places for 30 years. And so that's a good purification, you spend 30 years visiting holy places and meeting different saintly persons. He had no material responsibilities, he was actually a genuine, genuinely renounced person. So we'll hear more about renunciation today. Okay, lesson five, Dhritarashtra quits home. So the first section, Vidura's return to Hastinapur. And we mentioned Vidura didn't come back to Hastinapur just to enjoy the facilities, being in the palace, the royal palace. But he came, his purpose is to preach to his brother, Dhritarashtra. He's aware that all of Dhritarashtra's sons had been killed. And he's aware that Dhritarashtra is in old age, near to death. So Vidura has come to try to give him the benefit of his association. So Vidura preaches to Dhritarashtra and his preaching is very potent. And ultimately they leave home and Gandhari also follows them because Gandhari is a chaste wife of Dhritarashtra and she's, she follows him to death. So after they've gone, Maharaj Yudhisthira finds out and he asks Sanjay, where did they go? What happened? Where are they? Because when they left, they didn't tell anyone. And so the next morning, when Maharaj Yudhisthira came to offer respects to them, he couldn't find them. <coughs> so Maharaj Yudhisthira asked Sanjay, because San Sorry, I have a little bit of a cold. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Sanjay had been with Dhritarashtra. He was the secretary of Dhritarashtra. He spent years with Dhritarashtra. He was his guide. He was everything for Dhritarashtra. And he couldn't imagine Dhritarashtra would go off without Sanjay. So Yuristir asked Sanjay, where did they go? What happened? But Sanjay. He, he didn't know. He, we will hear how Sanjay replies as we go on. Let's go back, go through the chapter a little bit. So Vidura has come back and he's going to preach to Dhritarashtra. So Vidura's approach, and we quote here from the purport, text 13, According to Niti Shastra, one should not sp speak an unpalatable truth to cause distress to others. This is also stated, of course, in the Bhagavad Gita, right? If you study the Bhagavad Gita, austerity is described, uh, austerity of speech. Austerity of speech is described that one should not, one should speak words which are pleasing and truthful. 
And Prabhupada also quoted the statement, Satyam Bruyat Priyam Bruyat. That when we speak the truth, we should make it palatable to people. So here it's mentioned from the Niti Shastra, which is civil law, one should not speak an unpalatable truth just simply to cause distress to others. We should speak words which are pleasing to people. Uh, but then Prabhupada also explained, he said, for preaching that is not required. When we preach, we're not expected to do that. But we have to understand, you know, what right have we got to preach? We want to preach to people who are actually, ex who accept us as a, their teacher. If we try to preach to people who are not our students, then simply they will become offended. Just like Prabhupada warned us, he said, be careful about criticizing other so-called spiritual people, other so-called te teachers. Just like here in Bengal, if you criticize somebody who is, a, you know, the Bengali saints, one of the Bengali saints, if we criticize them, then you can get in a lot of trouble. The people can get really angry at you. So Prabhupada was, he taught us that we, we never criticize the person, but we ask, what does he teach? What is his philosophy? And then we criticize, we can attack that. We have to ask, what do they teach? What's their philosophy? Attack, you can attack that. But don't just criticize the person, because that will upset the local people. The local people have some respect for their for the people from their society, from their culture. So we should be very careful. And Prabhupada also told us, he said, I can, talk, I can call people rascals and fools and mudhas. He said, I can talk to them like that. He said, but you cannot. Of course, Prabhupada could do it because Prabhupada was so senior. He's so much senior in realization, senior in position as the founder, as the acharya. And, of course, he was much, so much senior in age as well. And so he could, ta he could preach like that. He could talk to people and criti criticize the modern society. But he warned us to be careful how we preach, that we don't want to make enemies. So it's mentioned here, don't speak an unpalatable truth to cause distress to others. Distress comes upon us in its own way by the laws of nature. So one should not aggravate it by propaganda. For a compassionate soul like Vidura, especially in his dealings with the beloved Pandavas, it was almost impossible to disclose an unpalatable piece of news, like the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty. Therefore, he purposely refrained from it. Right? So it, it's mentioned here. Uh, Vidura knew about the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty, but he didn't bring it up. He didn't want to mention it to the, all, to the Pandavas, and he didn't want to bring it up in the palace. So we see in the first canto, we see what's happening. You're having the the disappearance of these different great souls. We had the disappearance of Grandfather Bhishma, and now we're going to hear about Dhritarashtra also leaving home with his wife Gandhari. And then after that, we will hear about Lord Krishna also leaving the world. And Lord, before Lord Krishna leaves the world, you have the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty. So Sridhar Swami, one of the very, the, the most senior commentator on Srimad Bhagavatam, he explains that it's very important that in presenting the Srimad Bhagavatam, first of all, you have to have uh, Maharaj Yudhisthir and Arjuna and also Vidura coming to Hastinapur. 
because they come to Hastinapur, they're arranging different things, like Vidura comes, he arranges for the disappearance of Dhritarashtra, and then Arjuna comes, he's come back from Dwarka, and he tells how the Yadu dynasty has all been annihilated, and even Lord Krishna has left the world. And when they hear that, then Maharaj Yudhisthira, the Pandavas, they, they know it's time for them also to leave the world. So they enthrone Maharaj Parikshit and they go off to the Himalayas. And the scene is set for the cursing of Maharaj Parikshit and then the appearance of Sukadeva Goswami. So like that, the first canto is for the disappearance of these great souls and then Maharaj Yudhisthira becoming the emperor, ruling and then be, being cursed, and then the appearance of Sukadeva Goswami at the end of the first canto. So Vidura is preaching to Dhritarashtra. It's not an easy job to convince Dhritarashtra to get out of the house, get out of the palace. Why? Dhritarashtra is thinking he's the king Although he was never the king, because he was born blind, he could never really be the king. He should have been the king because he was the eldest son. But because he was blind, he couldn't be the king. The king cannot be blind. You have to have a king who could... So, Dhritarashtra was the eldest son, but he couldn't be the king. So Pandu became the king. But then Pandu had his problem and... He had to retire, and so it came back to Dhritarashtra because all the children were very young. The Pandavas were very young children, and Dhritarashtra's sons were very young. So the throne came back to Dhritarashtra. So although he was blind, he was trying to rule. So Vidura is preaching to him, your body now is overtaken by invalidity. You, you were born blind, materially you're blind, and spiritually he was blind. So blindness, that was one thing. But then also invalidity, that was also coming over him very fast, very quickly. Then it's mentioned, your teeth are loose, your liver is defective, and you are coughing up mucus. God, it sounds like me, my goodness. The liver is defective, right? bad digestion, the teeth are falling out, you see. This is old age, this is the sign. When the, Krishna shows us how we're getting near to death every day. We have to be conscious. And then Vidura gets really heavy. You are living just like a household dog and are eating the remnants of food given by Bhima. Eee, Bhima. And Bhima is the one who killed all the sons of Dhritarashtra, particularly Duryodhan and Dushasan, the two favorite sons of Dhritarashtra. They were both killed by Bhima, as well as all the other sons. And there is Dhritarashtra living in the home, eating the remnants of food given by Bhima. Ooh, not very pleasant. Despite your unwillingness to die and your desire to live, even at the cost of honor and prestige, your miserly body will certainly dwindle and deteriorate like an old garment. This is the situation. None of us are willing to die. We're all unwilling to die. We're all thinking, I don't want to die, I want to live. But we know we have to die. There's no way we can avoid it. As sure as death, Prabhupada used to say, as sure as death, and death is certain. So your desire to live at the cost of honor and prestige, he has, he has no more honor. He has no more prestige. 
but still he desires to live. Your miserly body will dwindle. It's already dwindled. So, this is preaching. Prabhupada explains, a sadhu is to speak to the householders about the naked truth of life, so that they may come to their senses about the precarious life in material existence. Householders generally don't like to hear this kind of strong preaching, but it's justified in this particular case, because Dhritarashtra is at the end of life, and he's coming in the line of great kings, and they're meant to show the example. They were not ordinary people, they were not just common people, but they were all great kings, so they had great powers, and Dhritarashtra he should be an example, and he should show properly. He does, his sons, at least his sons, they died on the battlefield, so that was glorious. Their death was on the battlefield. They died fighting. They were heroes. But if Dhritarashtra just dies at home like a, like a dog, it's not good. So he has to be aware, made, he has to be made aware of his situation. Prabhupada's purport is very powerful. At the present moment, there are Dhritarashtras in every home. To stick to family life, to the end of one's human life, is the grossest type of degradation. And there is an absolute need for the Viduras to educate such Dhritarashtras, even at the present moment. <laughs> we need Viduras. We need these renounce, renounce people. They don't have to be sannyasis, but they should be convinced of the need of, the need to get out from the entanglement of family life, the material attachment, very important, right? It's to stick to family life. So Prabhupada then goes on to explain about his own situation, because Prabhupada was also in family life, and he had a good five children. He has a nice wife. Bengali wife, five children, nice children, not all married. They were not all married when Prabhupada left home. So Srila Prabhupada explains, We are not ashamed to admit that this fact was experienced in our practical life. No, Prabhupada's honest. He said, we're not ashamed, I admit. Were we not favoured by His Divine Grace, Srimad Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj, by our first meeting for a few minutes only, it would have been impossible for us to accept this mighty task of describing Srimad Bhagavatam in English. So very wonderful that Srila Prabhupada took up this task of translating the Srimad Bhagavatam to the English language. Of course, it was a mon monumental task to present purports on each verse for all the twelve cantos. Prabhupada was not able to complete it, but major portion of it was completed by him. <laughs> And nobody else had actually, we, had, we don't see, at least I don't know of other people who have given the, such detailed commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam and provided us with the evidence of the previous acharyas. 
So Prabhupada took up this work. Before he even went to America, he'd already translated and published the first canto. And he took the first canto with him. He took some cases of the first canto, sets of the first canto were packed in boxes and it was all shipped and went to America with Prabhupada. And when Prabhupada was there, he was distributing Srimad Bhagavatam. And for some time, we were printing the second canto. It came out one chapter at a time. One chapter at a time, they publish. So it took some years. It was going on for years. Prabhupada was writing and translating, publishing. And then at one point, he took up the Chaitanya Charitamrita, and he completed the Chaitanya Charitamrita, that was wonderful, and then came back to Srimad Bhagavatam. Nectar of Devotion was also completed very, very early on in the movement, when Prabhupada had first come. Ishopanishad was done by Prabhupada in India. He had published it in his Back to Godhead newspaper and later on he collected it and they put it into a book. A Krishna book was written in, when Prabhupada went to America. So Prabhupada explains the power of that moment's association with a powerful spiritual teacher. Without seeing him at that opportune moment, we could have become a very great business magnet, but never would we have been able to walk the path of liberation and be engaged in the factual service of the Lord under instruction of his divine grace. So Prabhupada's describing, you know, yeah, he could have taken a job, he could have worked in business, he could have, may, may have become a successful businessman, but he would never be able to do the work which he's doing, which he did in the service of the Lord. So this was the power of the association, because Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati immediately challenged him that you are a nice young man, why don't you take up the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and spread the message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu everywhere. And of course Prabhupada was in his Gandhi clothes, he was wearing khadi and he was saying, oh no, we have to get independence for India. And Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati turned on him and said, Krishna consciousness is so important, it cannot wait for any political adjustment. And Bhaktisiddhanta overwhelmed him, defeated Prabhupada. Prabhupada understood he had met a very great devotee. He was very happy, impressed, created a lasting impression. All right, so then. Vidura preaches to Dhritarashtra and Dhritarashtra is convinced that he should get out from the palace. So during the night, Vidura and Dhritarashtra, followed by Gandhari, they leave the home. So the next morning, Maharaj Yudhisthira comes and he is asking Sanjay, where are they? Where did they go? And at that time, Sanjay, Sanjay says, I have been cheated by these great souls. Sanjay could understand, I mean, I guess everybody, they were all there at the preaching, they were all sitting listening to Vidura preach. The whole palace, everyone in the palace would come and sit and Vidura would be talking. But he would, he'd be talking to everyone, not only Dhritarashtra, he's talking to everyone about the nature of time and the decaying effects and how Kali Yuga is coming. And he was also indicating, not directly saying, but he was indicating that soon the Lord is also going to leave. So, 
privately, Dhritarashtra and, San, and Vidura talked, and Dhritarashtra was convinced that he, he would go with Vidura, they would get out of the palace. So that they didn't tell anybody. So the next morning when Yudhisthira asked Sanjay, where did they go? At that time Sanjay says that I have been cheated by these great souls. He understood that they've left the home, they've gone to seek perfection in their spiritual life. They're preparing for the next life. So they're great souls. So Prabhupada in his purport, he says, that great souls cheat others may be astonishing to know. But it is, it is a fact that great souls cheat others for a great cause. Right? So what are some examples of great souls cheating? Hands up, who knows? Give one example. Great soul who cheated. There are many. Okay, give you a few minutes, write some down. See, see how many you can write down. Okay, how many examples have you got? I think three are in the purport. Yes? Anybody? Can we have some examples? Yes, who's... Okay, uh, Sachitanai Prabhu. Did he cheat? Oh, he didn't cheat, but he left home. Okay, we're talking about cheating. Of course, he left home, but, but I wanted examples about cheating. They actually cheated. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he, he told some people, he, warned, he told some people he was leaving. His mother also knew he was leaving. He talked to them about it. Yeah, let's hear somebody else. Sanatana Goswami. Okay, Sanatana. What did Sanatana do? What happened? Sanatana Goswami left his kingdom and relieved Rupa by paying money to kill him. Yes, he was in the jail, right? Yeah, he was in prison. The Nawab didn't want him to go, put him in the prison. So well, how did he get out? Do you know? He had gold coin to the jailer. He told the jailer, he said, I'm going to go to Mecca. Because he, you know, because as far as the jailer knows, he, the, the, he's a Mohammedan. They were, you know, they were, it was a Mohammedan ruler. And so Sanatan also was, he had a Mohammedan name and he was looking like a Mohammedan. And so he told him, I'm going to go to Mecca. If you let me go, I, you know, it will be good for you. You'll benefit. 
And he said, told the jailer, he said, when they ask what happened, just say that you took me by the banks of the Ganga and I, was, I fell in the Ganga and drowned. And so he, in this way he bribed the jailer and got out of jail. Okay, another example. Who else have we got? Yeah, Kanu, is it? Karuna Tara Devi Dasi. Oh, I can't hear you, Manaji. Raghunath Das. Right. Raghunath Das. Where did he go when he left home? He went to Puri, right? He went to be with Lord Chaitanya in Jagannath Puri. So his parents were always trying to catch him, bring him back. So, Raghunath Das, Sanatana Goswami, another example who cheated. In the purport, there are three examples. Is one more not given yet? Yes? Who have we got then? Karuna Tarad, oh, uh, Murti Manohar. Prabhu. Thank you, Maharaj. I was thinking of Lord uh, Bhamanadev. He asked for just three steps from Bali Maharaj. And that three steps happened to take over, um, went everywhere, all over the material universe, all over the heavenly planets. And, so oh, okay. Things. Yeah, that's a good example. I think so. Yes. It's not given in the purport, but it's quite reasonable that there was some tr trickery there. <laughs> Yes, Vinay Damodar. In Ramayan, huh? in Ramayan, Lord Ram killed Bali. Was that cheating? Yeah, he was behind. He, the, he was hiding behind the tree. Oh, from because, because he was behind the tree. Okay. Yes, Dineshwara. Okay. <laughs> he was tricked. <laughs> All right, yeah. Brikasura. Lord Krishna comes disguised as a Brahmana. Mm. Many examples, yeah? And, uh, this is uh, Manjari. What's this? Mur Murti. Ma oh no, Murti. Uh, uh, uh. Ravi Shankar Prabhu. You can give an example. Ras Rashekar Prabhu. Sukadev Goswami? Uh, he was, uh, before uh, coming to the great uh, 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 Rishit Maharaj, he used to wander and uh, he used to uh, disguise himself as if he is a bad man. He did not open his real uh, identity. Oh, so that's, that's you, you describe that as cheating, eh? And Jadbarat also the same way, is it? Yes, yes, Maharaj. 
But I don't know if that's actually cheating. Okay, Lord Krishna, that's the one, right. That's in the purport, right? Who? Uh, Rupa Goswami. Rupa Goswami used to take leave from his job to study Shrimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> he, 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 he's not well. He's not well. And, and he's not going to the job. <laughs> okay, so this, that was just cheating, eh? What about Lord Krishna's cheating? You didn't tell me about that. was the trickery. He wanted to tell that Ashwatthama is dead and then Durya, Dronacharya would not fight yes, and then they could kill Dronacharya. Yes, so that was trickery, transcendental trickery for the pleasure of the Lord. Ramanujacharya also che cheated. Ramanujacharya, he was a married man but he had some problem, difficulties with his wife and at one point he just decided he couldn't, it was enough and he, he, had, he told his wife that your father wrote a letter, you have to go home immediately, he wants you there. So she rushed home to her father and then Ramanuja went away and took sannyas. So he cheated his wife for a great cause. So, the great souls cheat, they do it for a great cause, yes? Um, Ramanujacharya took the mantra from his guru and he said he won't tell anyone but he told the whole village. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's actually cheating. <laughs> anyway, he did it, certainly he disobeyed the order of his guru. But the Guru then, then appreciated when he heard. The Guru appreciated that he had the right intention. He wanted to liberate everyone. So his Guru was appreciative of that. And so transcendental trickery. And Prabhupada also talks about how he also did some trickery, right? What was Prabhupada's trickery? Janmastami Prabhu, do you know? Janmastami. Can you, uh, do you remember Prabhupada, how did Prabhupada cheat? Um, he tricked all of us. I don't know if you're this from the purport. <laughs> <laughs> he got us to you know, chant, dance, and be happy. And uh, you know, uh, stay high forever. That was a, a good one. Um, huh? I'm not sure if there was something from the purport or not that you're referring to. Yeah, the, definitely the, there was some trickery. No, what happened was his wife, he, he asked his wife, what do you want, tea or me? Right? He told his wife, you have to choose. You have to choose between tea and me. Do you want tea or do you want me? And so his wife said, oh, I'd rather have tea. <laughs> so his wife said, I prefer tea. And so that was it. So Prabhupada said, all right. And then Prabhupada left. And of course, they never thought that he was leaving for good. But Prabhupada never came back. He didn't come home. So that was the trickery. Prabhupada. Maharaj, yes? Uh, may I have your permission to ask one question? Okay. Uh, actually, Prabhupada uh, left uh, his home uh, because of the tea. So any householder who is having children, uh, like you mentioned, he has five children and they were unmarried. 
He had a wife to take care. So how should we understand this pastime? Well, they were not all unmarried. They were not all unmarried. There was one daughter remaining, not yet married, when he left home. There was still one daughter remaining, but others were married. Okay, Maharaj, thank you for correcting me, but I am uh, unable to understand and appreciate if there is a, a daughter who is unmarried, then it becomes the father's responsibility to uh, settle her. So no, father was already retired. Older brothers were there to take care. Okay, it's the responsibility of the older brothers. Fathers doesn't carry the responsibility all the time. Prabhupada was already elderly and retired. He stopped his business. No more business. Sons were there. They were working. They could arrange. Thank you, Maharaj. Krishna takes care. That's the real point, that actually Krishna takes care. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. So, a devotee, of course, devotee is not neglectful. Uh, we, sometimes we talk about people, we hear about people, they want to renounce. So, Renunciation is to take on more responsibility. In Krishna consciousness, renunciation is not to give up responsibility, but is to become more responsible, to take on more responsibility. Just as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he had a young wife, 16 years old, and an elderly mother, a widow. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left home, so we may think, how, how could he be so irresponsible? But you have to understand, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has to think of the higher purpose, the higher cause to deliver the world, to give Krishna consciousness to the whole world. And the devotees are there, the devotees take care. Mother Sachi, Vishnu Priya, they were not neglected. They had the se their servant also. Ishan is there taking care. So we have to understand the higher cause. As Prabhupada says here, great souls cheat for a great cause, for a greater cause. Not to just run away from responsibility. What I was in, uh, I, I heard there was one man in Hong Kong, Indian man, and he came to Prabhupada and he told Prabhupada, he said, Swamiji, I want to take sannyas. So Prabhupada said to him, oh, really? Why? And the man said, oh, I have a wife and four children at home, it's terrible. <laughs> so, of course, Prabhupada never encouraged such a person to be so irresponsible. But when somebody like Gorgovinda came, Gorgovinda Maharaj, when he came and met Prabhupada, you know, he also had, was married and he had children. And he'd gone from home, he'd been out from home for some time and been moving around, going different places. He came to Vrindavan and he met Prabhupada and he was impressed. He saw Prabhupada and he saw everything Prabhupada was teaching and it was everything he wanted. And he spoke with Prabhupada, and Prabhupada understood this man is very qualified. Because Gorgovinda had prepared throughout his life a lifetime of devotion. He was fully devoted. He, he knew everything. He didn't have to learn anything. But somebody doesn't know anything, and they just want to give up responsibility, and becomes that that kind of person cannot become a sannyasi. So you have to consider everything, the time, the place, the circumstances, the qualification. Just like Vidura, we said Vidura. He been he spent thirty years traveling, visiting holy places, hearing from the greatest souls. So when he came back to preach to Dhritarashtra, it's very powerful. And Dhritarashtra is convinced that he cannot just die like a dog 
in the home of his enemy. He has to get out. So even though he's blind and in old age, he got out from the home. Right? He got out from the home and Bhagavatam describes how they left and they went to the south side of the Himalayas. It's a place where the seven branches of the Ganga and it's described there how Dhritarashtra was taking bath three times a day and he was just drinking water. No food, no solid food, just drinking water. And he was doing Astanga Yoga, meditating. So that's described at the end of the chapter, just a minute we're hearing. They've just gone out from the home, so Narada Muni has come. Anyway, this, let's read this quote here. Prabhupada is talking about his own experience. He said, We also had the same opportunity to cheat the family members and leave home to engage in the service of Srimad Bhagavatam. Such cheating was necessary for a great cause, and there is no loss for any party in such transcendental fraud. So Prabhupada calls it transcendental fraud. Now later on, after Prabhupada was out from the home, his, his son, well, his son had already, he had, when Prabhupada went to America on the ship, his son had come to see him off. Prabhupada didn't go home because he's a sannyasi. He doesn't go home after leaving home. He came back to Calcutta, but he didn't go home again to see the family. But his son did come to see him. And after Prabhupada came back from America, then his son came and his son wanted Prabhupada to help him start a business. So Prabhupada engaged him in Krishna consciousness. He told him, he said, you can distribute my books. He said, you can take orders for my sets of Srimad Bhagavatam. You can go to the libraries and distribute my books. And for some time his son was doing that. His son took up that service for some time. So Prabhupada was not neglectful, but at the same time he was engaging, tried to engage the family in Krishna consciousness. So the service of the the service which Prabhupada did was certainly greater than just simply being at home, being with the family, being with the children. Hmm. The Vedic culture, Vedic culture says from the age of 50 or over, you have to prepare for the next life because death warning is there. Now we're old, you're old, in old age, any time death will come. We cannot say, I'm not ready yet. Any time death can come, you have to be ready. And that's why people get out from the house. That's the very culture, Varnashram, Vanaprast, and then sannyasa, even for some people. But Vanaprastha is necessary, it's required. You don't have to leave the wife, but you have to be out from the home. So Narada Muni instructs Maharaj Yudhisthira and hints that the Lord's pastimes may come to an end. He hints, he doesn't want to talk about it because it's not of the devotees of the Lord. They don't want to hear about the Lord's pastimes coming to an end. It's too painful for them. They just want to get out. They, they don't like to discuss it. So Vidura didn't bring it up. And Narada Muni's come. He also knows that, that the Lord's pastimes of Compton. He's not going to talk about it. So Maharaj Yudhisthira, he doesn't know yet. So Narada Muni has come 
and he's going to give instruction. He's going to talk to Maharaj Yudhisthira and tell him, because Narada Muni is omniscient. He knows what's happened. He knows where Dhritarashtra has gone and he knows what's taking place. So he's, he's, talk, he's instructing Maharaj Yudhisthira and Sanjay what's happening. Right? That Dhritarashtra has gone with Vidura and they've gone there in the Ganga and take bath three times and just drink water. Don't worry about food. Drink water, you can maintain the life. And he's doing yoga, meditation. That's Tanga Yoga. And Narada Muni says, within five days, his body will be burned to ashes in the fire of mystic yoga. So Dhritarashtra will get free from material body. Now he won't get pure devotional service. Why didn't Vidura give him pure devotional service? Any of you know? Vidura knows about devotional service. Why didn't he give, why didn't he make Dhritarashtra a pure devotee? Yes? Uh, because uh, Dhritarashtra was inimical to the Pandavas, because he tried to kill them, but they are pure devotees of the Lord, and that's why he didn't achieve the mercy of the Lord to become pure devotee. Yes. But he's got the mercy of a devotee, right? He's got the mercy of Vidura. Because he listened to Vidura and he followed Vidura, he left home, he went out from the home. So that was the mercy of a devotee. He got that much mercy from the devotee to get him out from the, the palace, to go into the forest and to prepare for the next life, for a better life. A little association with Vidura saved him from a, what could have been a terrible situation because he'd been so offensive to devotees. He had, he had committed offences. He'd allowed so many things to take place and he was so, even though Vidura had told him, you know, this battle is not good. Actually, Vidura left home just before the battle of Kurukshetra. It was just before the battle of Kurukshetra when he left home. So he, at that time he was telling Dhritarashtra, don't listen to Duryodhan. And so Duryodhan got angry and Duryodhan threw Vidura out of the palace. So this was just before the battle of Kurukshetra. And so Vidura left and then for 30 years or more, or less, he was wandering around the holy places. And now he's come back to give mercy to Dhritarashtra. So Dhritarashtra had been offensive, but he was able to get some level of perfection. What did he get? What did he achieve? Janastami Prabhu? Yeah, he became Dira, but not Narottama. Ah, yeah, different, there are different stages of renunciation, right? Prabhupada explains, we have Dira, and after Dira, before Narottama, there's one more stage? Sanyas. Right, Sanyas. And then Naratama. Can you explain to us the difference, these stages? Um, Odira is, is a, is a um, stage of detachment, um, material um, entanglement, but it's not, um, you know, it's kind of then you just go and um, stay away from the things that that are attached, that one is, becomes attached to materially. And then sannyas 
Hmm. There, there is a, a much more of a devotional aspect with sannyas that's involved, whereas it's more or less just stopping with jira. And then the Narottama, he, he's a, the perfect devotee, pure devotee. Right. Narottama is the perfect pure devotee, everything dedicated for the service of the Lord. So Dira, Dhritarashtra became Dira, sober-minded, Dira Statra Namuyati, right? Bhagavad Gita says that one who is sober, not disturbed by the change of body. So Dhritarashtra was Dira, he couldn't become Naratama, he wasn't ready for sannyas, couldn't become Naratama. But he, he achieved that level of renunciation, dira. And Srila Prabhupada explains that the level which he had reached, you have to take birth several, many times before he can become a devotee, before he's able to engage in devotional service, it will take many more births. And Prabhupada quotes the verse from Bhagavad Gita, uh, Yesham Twantagatam Papam Jananam Punya Karmana Te Danva Mohanir Mukta Bajanti Mam Drada Vrada. Right? Persons who have acted piously in previous lives and in this life and who are free from the reactions to past sins, then they can engage themselves in my devotional service with determination. So Dhritarashtra had committed many offences, several offences, because his attachment to his sons, that family attachment, that great bondage, very strong. Although his sons were so bad, but he was still attached to them. And so this was a big problem for his spiritual elevation. So he became Dira, he got some impersonal liberation, something like that, kind of impersonal liberation. So Narada explains to Sanjay and Yudhisthira Maharaj how Dhritarashtra will give up his body. And what about Gandhari? What will happen to her? Amala Murti, Amanjari, Amala Manjari Mataji, do you know what happens to Gandhari? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, did she jump into the fire? I don't know if she jumped into it, but she walked into it. Walked yeah. into the, right? Sati. Yeah. Sati. Why? Sati performed Sati. Yeah. I just saw uh, a notice here, there's a notice here from Atul Krishna Prabhu who said uh, there's a law in India that anybody who's preaching about the, the glories of sati, that this sati performance of sati is a good thing, and then there's a, there's a fine, a heavy fine and imprisonment as well. Imprisonment from one to three years and a fine from 5,000 to 30,000 rupees. So that, that was in 1980, 80, 1987, they passed a law like that. And so in India they have a very critical mood of this. And so this is something from the past, of course, and before the Kali Yuga. Although it was current for some time also in India, but Maybe you could describe to me what were some of the qualities of Gandhari which caused her to act like this? Amala Ma Manjari Manj Mataji? What, what, was what was the qualities of Gandhari? She was a chaste wife. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
someone, someone else, somebody else knows some qualities of Gandhari that made her so powerful, so Yes. Um, I think Gandhari, um, when, uh, when there was some inauspicious sign, when Duryodhana and everyone was born, um, he, she was being advised by Dhridrashtra and her been advised by sages to just, you know, disown them. Um, but Dhridrashtra, uh, but Gandhari also spoke about this to Dhridrashtra. According to Sri Dharma, she did her thing, but um, Dhridrashtra didn't listen to her. It's a different story. And also she closed her eyes, like when Dhridraksha was blind, she also followed, she was all along chased and she followed her husband, when he was blind, she also closed her eyes. Yes, that, that's generally how much, how, how we appreciate Gandhari. Why did she cover her eyes? Uh, because Dhridraksha was blind then, and she didn't want to see. I, I met one couple, I was, you know, I used to do life membership and I remember I went to one office and there was a man there and he was blind and he had his wife there and his wife was doing, taking care of him. And so it seems, you know, it seems like Gandhari could do better, that she, she, why did she need to cover her eyes? Why doesn't she just take care of her husband and be the eyes for her husband? Can you explain to me why? Um, so, uh, <laughs> I don't know. can speculate, but... Yeah, go ahead, speculate. She doesn't want to be... She doesn't want to see that prostitution done by her husband and her son. She doesn't want to be what? <clears throat> the atrocities done by her husband and sons. She doesn't want to witness. Yeah. Or she didn't want to see other men. She didn't want to see other men. I don't think you've got the right reason. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's very nice that you say like that, she doesn't want to see other men. <laughs> but she was already chased. Why would she cover her eyes? If she said her, like what I read, she said, if my husband cannot see, I don't want to see. I don't want something what my husband does. Right, that's right. She doesn't want to be more than her husband. Right? She wants to be, she wants, she doesn't want to be more than what her husband is. So her husband blind, so she, I should also be blind. And they have so many people there in the palace to take care of them. So many servants in there, so they were not worried. But she didn't want to be more than her husband. My husband, I should follow my husband. Wife, that's the position of the wife, to follow the husband, not to be greater than the husband, not to be above the husband. At least in the Vedic culture, like that, nowadays, of course, different, the modern times, different mood is there. So Gandhari entered into the fire, and in this way she gave up her body along with her husband. And of course, people who perform sati, they say like that, they say that they go together, right? The wife follows the husband. <laughs> there was a case, uh, in Pr when Prabhupada was in England, he met with, there was this very famous English man, a musician, you know, musicians are very famous. He was in the music group called the Beatles. So his name was John Lennon. He was very famous in Prabhupada's time. The Beatles were very famous all over the world. So John Lennon was one of the main members in the group. 
and very much respected in the world. People would ask him, what is your opinion like this and that. So he had, he had, a, he had a wife, named, a Japanese woman named Yoko Ono. So they, they both met Prabhupada because Prabhupada had actually stayed. The devotees were staying at the home of John Lennon. He had this big house, a big estate. And so the devotees were given a part of it where they could stay because we had no temple in London at that time. So the devotees were staying there and Prabhupada was, had a, a room also. So John Lennon and his wife Yoko Ono, they came to meet Prabhupada and they wanted to get a blessing from Prabhupada that they could be husband and wife in the next life also. <laughs> so when Prabhupada heard this from them, Prabhupada just scoffed at them and said, I cannot give such a blessing. Mm. The, the, this, of course, this was the thinking of materialistic people who were very strongly attached to sense gratification. But what you have in the Vedic times, the, the wife following the husband, this was uh, very different from the mood which was expressed there with the, this English man and his Japanese woman. So, generally, the, the woman wants to follow the husband. But nowadays, of course, in this Kali Yuga, we, they don't, the government, are, they don't allow. As I said, even, even if you preach about it and encourage it, it's illegal and you can be arrested and taken to court, heavy punishment. So it's very much frowned and looked down on today. Okay, let's see. But Gandhari, anyway, she she did this, and of course we know also when Pandu, when Pandu died, his wife Madri, she also left the body with Pandu, and Madri already had two children, and Kunti was left to take care of them, so she had Kunti had to bring up all the children on her own. Okay, so. This is a, quite a big chapter, a lot of interesting points in it, very instructive. Now, I wanted to ask you about when Maharaj Yudhisthira discovered that they'd left home, Gandhari and Dhritarashtra had gone, what was Yudhisthira's mood? Well, how did he take that news? Did he think that, oh, let them go, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're our enemies, we don't want them anyway, you know, let them, or they're old, we don't want to have to be bothered with these old people. And what was his thinking, Amala Manjari, do you know? First feeling was guilty. He it, thought that he didn't take care of his uh, uncle and aunt properly, so they felt bad and left. Yes, right. So th that's a very good quality, isn't it? Why is that a good quality? Devotee feels that everything is my mistake, never finds fault in others. Yes, right. A devotee wants to see his own faults. He doesn't see the faults in others. Yeah. So Maharaj Yudhisthira was like that. He was thinking, what, what, what did Maharaj Yudhisthira think again? What had he done wrong? He didn't, uh, he didn't take care of his uncle and aunt properly. So they were feeling bad. Yeah. So they left. Why would they be feeling sad? Uh, because their all children had died. Yes, right. And he didn't give proper respect. Yes, they lost a hundred, their hundred, one hundred sons, all killed in the battle of Kurukshetra. So certainly they were feeling grief. 
and then they have to come and stay in the palace, in the home, with the people who, with Bhima, who killed their children. So, it must have been difficult, tense situation. And so when they're not there, Maharaj Yudhisthira thinks maybe they've gone and thrown themselves in the, in the Ganges, maybe they've drowned themselves or something. So he, he blames himself that I haven't taken care of them. It's a, a very interesting point to see his wonderful qualities. You know, we spoke a lot about Maharaj Yudhisthira, his leader, leadership qualities how he was concerned to protect everyone and care for everyone and provide for everyone's needs. And so Maharaj Yudhisthira, was, when they'd gone, and he, he blamed himself. The, there's a pastime, they say that uh, they wanted to find, they said, go on, they, they, asked, they asked Maharaj Yudhisthira, Go, go outside and see if there's any bad people out there. Bring a bad person. Bring some bad, very sinful person. Bring some bad person here. So Maharaj Yudhisthira went out and came back. He said, everybody's good. There are no bad people. And then he asked Duryodhan, Duryodhan, you go outside, see if there's any good people. And Duryodhan went out and came back, he said, there's, there's no good people, they're all bad people. So the moral is, we see others as we are ourselves. Maharaj Yudhisthira was so good, he thought himself, he thought he was so good, because he was so good, he thought also Dhritarashtra and Gandhari, everyone there, also very good. He didn't find any fault, any had no complaint about them. And how does Narada Muni preach when he comes to Hastinapur? How does he present? How do, he just suddenly appears there in Hastinapur? What is what is he? He doesn't immediately talk about Vidura and Dhritarashtra. What does he speak about? Narada Muni, what's his, his preaching? We heard about Vidura's preaching. He was preaching to Dhritarashtra and he was preaching very strongly. How about Narada Muni? When Narada Muni comes, what's he preaching about? About Krishna, that Krishna is taking care of everyone. Yes, yes, right. What's the moral? What, why does he say this? It is, it is not Yudhishthira Maharaj who is taking care of them, it is Krishna who is taking care of everyone. Yes. And wherever they are, Krishna will protect them. Right. Yeah. So, Dhritarashtra was in illusion and Maharaj Yudhishthira was also in illusion, right? What was their illusion? Yeah, Hamala Manjari Manaji. What what illusion was Dhritarashtra in? Dhritarashtra was thinking he is the king and he was in the bodily concept attached to his children. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and who who Maharaj was feeling responsible for them. Yeah, Yudhisthira Maharaj was also in some illusion. Of course, Yudhisthira Maharaj is one of the Pandavas, he's a great devotee. Can it be in any illusion? But it appears like that because in, in some, he's thinking, you know, the, oh, where's my uncle? Where's my aunt? I have to look after them. He was thinking like that, I have to look after them, I have to care for them. But Narada Muni says, we all live by the grace of the Lord. The Supreme Lord is providing for everyone. Right? So Mahavira Prabhu, Mahavira? Yes? Mahavira Prabhu? 
Yes, Maharaj. What what did they what are they going to eat? Who's going what food are they going to eat? Sanjay, Gandhari. How are they going to get food? You, uh, you mentioned, uh, Maharaj, that uh, they, they did not have any food, they just had water because they were uh, doing Ashtang you. Well, that was Dhritarashtra anyway, yes. So, Gandhari being a chaste wife, she had, uh, like, she followed the husband, so she could not eat if Dhritarashtra would, wouldn't eat. Yes. And if they do want to eat, is food there? No. Huh? No, food is not there. Why not? Definitely food is there. Oh, fruits, fruits, yes, they can eat fruits. Fruits are there, vegetables are there, leaves are there, herbs are there. There's many things there. When you want to eat, if you're really desperate, you can find things to eat. I met one lady, she'd been living in the mountains in China and she'd been living there for years. I asked her, what do you eat? She said, oh, I find some potato, something grows somewhere, find something. There's no shop, there's no store, no supermarket, no mall. <laughs> what do you eat? It's all provided by nature, the gifts of God. The fruit, the leaves, the, the branches, the roots, the twigs, There's, you can always find something. So, Narada Muni explains, everyone lives by the grace of God and he gives also the law of nature that one living entity is food for another. Right? Those who have those who have arms and legs, they they can what how does it go? I, I can't remember the verse. Do you remember? Those who have no legs, they are food for those with legs. And those who have legs, they are food for those with hands and legs. Like this different species of life. One living entity is food for another. This is a law of nature given by Narada Muni is telling like this. The Supreme Lord provides for everyone. I, there, there, there's a, there was a book, it, it's called Death in Banaras. And it tells about one Hindu family, they came to Benares, the father was preparing for death. And the family all came with him. And it tells how the father, in the beginning, he was not eating any solid food, no grains. And then after some time, then he stopped eating grains and he would just take water. And then when he stopped taking water, he did full fasting. Then he left the body. He came to Benares to give up the body. And so even today these things go on like that. We had one devotee, one, one devotee who I used to work with. He was actually from Switzerland and he got cancer in the throat and he tried for some time to cure it, and he underwent painful treatment, expensive also, but no result. So he went to his spiritual master and he took permission from his spiritual master and he went back to Switzerland and he fasted. And in two weeks he gave up his body and he left his body on Janmastami on the holy day of Krishna's appearance. Because he thought, I'm not able to preach, I'm not able to speak, I'm not able to do anything, there's no point in service. So he just prepared himself to give up his body. And so that was just a few couple of years ago. So 
So we see Dhritarashtra. Prabhupada said, Dhritarashtra is in every home. Kali Yuga. We need Viduras to go and preach, to shake them, to awaken them, to get them to go out from the home. All right. Let's see. Here's a, a quote here. Narada Muni indicated that his body by itself would burn to ashes. The perfection of the yoga system is attained by such mystic power. The yogi is able to quit his body by his own choice of time and can attain any planet he desires by turning the present body into ashes by self-made fire. Who else gave up their body? Mystic fire. Who else did that? They sat in meditation and fire came out from the body, the body burned to ashes. Sati, right, yes. Sati. Why did she do that? Because Daksha insulted her husband. Right, she didn't want to have that father. She didn't want connection with that Daksha as a father. So she decided to give up her body. So the yogi can choose the time and he can also, by his desire, determine which place he wants to go, which planet he wants to go, where is he going to go. They may go into the Brahma Jyoti in personal liberation. They may go to some higher planets like Janaloka, Tapaloka, Mahaloka, Brahmaloka, these higher planets in the universe. But they're not perfect. They're not able to go back to Godhead. They're not pure devotees. While outside observing her husband, who will burn in the fire of mystic power, along with his stash cottage, his chaste wife will enter the fire with rapt attention. So, very wonderful example given in the scriptures of the faithful wife following her husband, giving up her body to go with her husband. Prabhupada writes, this entering of a chaste lady into the fire of her dead husband is called the sati rite, and the action is considered to be most perfect for a woman. Narada Muni's prophecy prohibited Yudhisthira Maharaj from going to the place where his uncle was staying, because even after quitting the body by his own mystic power, Dhritarashtra would not be in need of any funeral ceremony. You know, may, may, Maharaj Yudhisthira may be thinking, I'll go and do the last rites, but Nar Narada Muni said, there'll be no need, because his body's already burned to ashes. It's already become ashes. You can't do anything to help him. So this prophecy of Narada Muni to Maharaj Yudhisthira forbade him to go to his widowed aunt. The, both of them would give up their bodies. What about Vidura? What's he going to do? Is he also going to go in the fire? No. What's he going to do? Manaji, Amala Manjari? He goes on pilgrimage. Yeah. What to do? Go back on pilgrimage, go out on pilgrimage, you know, just like if there's a death in the family, you lose somebody very dear to you, what can you do? You can just go out on pilgrimage, go out and, you know, get over it, that he's departed. We have to prepare for our departure. One day we also have to follow, we have to leave the world, we have to be prepared. 
We have to go and visit the holy places, see the holy places, hear about the Lord and the pastimes there. This is the purification, going to the holy dam. Okay, so, wait, are there any questions on this chapter before we go on? Yes, please, Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj actually just uh, like Abhimanyu was brutally uh, killed. Though his uh, spiritual master was Lord Krishna and his mother was uh, Mother Subhadra. So I didn't quite understand why uh, uh, Abhimanyu, such a great person and such a brave person, courageous person, was killed uh, so brutally in the battlefield. Well, one reason was, it's a glorious death to die on the battlefield. Now death is always going to be brutal, one way or another. But, you know, he's, Maharaj, I, I am told, uh, I heard somewhere in some lecture that he was not even given water when he asked why he was dying. Yes, well, of course that the Pandavas took revenge on that, but you have to understand the identity of Abhimanu. He was actually the son of the sun god. So the son of the sun god, he went there to take part in the pastimes, but the agreement was that he should come back very soon. He should come back to his heavenly abode very soon. So that was why he died there in the battle. Huh? Thank you very much, Maharaj. I understood. Yeah, there's higher purpose behind, you know, that his actual identity, that he's from the heavenly planet, he's the son of the sun god, he has a big position there, he goes back to the, his place. His family wanted him back in the heavenly abode, so he gave up his body. Yeah, giving up the body is always painful, but at the, at the same time it's joyful. You give up the body, you get rid of this body, you go back, get, get another, a, a new body. What is painful can be seen also as pleasure. Yes, Maharaj. Dadichi also said like that, he said that when the demigods asked him to give the bones from his body, Dadiji said, don't you know death is the most painful thing? But nevertheless, Dadiji agreed to give up his body. And he used a similar process as Dhritarashtra. He gave, you know, the different elements back into the, 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 uh, the, res into the store of these different elements, the earth from his body back into the earth, and his fire back into the fire, water back into the water of the universe, returned the element, gave up the gross body, and then the subtle body elements also. So the, the yogis, they, they do this, they give up the body. Abhimanu, he gave up his body on the battlefield. We heard there was two glorious deaths, right? Oh no, that you didn't hear that yet, but in the sixth canto it's described, there are two glorious deaths. One glorious death is to die in the mystic yoga, like Dhritarashtra, and the other glorious death is to die on the battlefield as a Kshatriya. It's a hero's death, very glorious. But to die in the home, it's like a dog, it's not good. You have to get out. We have to awaken this detachment. But Prabhupada warns you have to be convinced of a better life. If you're not convinced of the better life, then you'll go back after some time. You'll go back home again sometime. You won't stay away. You have to be convinced that there's a better life waiting for you. That's very important. And sometimes we see people, they take sannyas or they renounce, but then after some time they go back. They go back. Means they're not very convinced. They have, they're not fully convinced of the better life. So 
So one should be convinced. You give up, you give up the home, you, because it's a temp, the temporary home, the, body, the home of the body. The body is temporary, the home is temporary. You give up that home, you go out and prepare for the, for the next life. So Dhritarashtra, he didn't have to go out for long, he was already old, it was the end of his life. But he was very fortunate because he had that connection with Vidura. And with the grace of Vidura, he could go out from the home and achieve perfection. Not fully perfection, but, you know, to, to some degree perfection, that he gave up his body gloriously, and went to a higher destination, and it can go on from there. Yes. Whereas one doubt is there when Vidura came to Hastinapur, he explained everything except the annihilation of Yadu dynasty. So even when Narada Muni also came to meet Yudhishthir, he also didn't disclose about the annihilation of Yadu dynasty. Any specific reason regarding? Yes, the reason is it's very painful to, to discuss. It's very painful to discuss these things. Devotees, they don't like to hear about it. We don't like to just, just like the disappearance of great, the disappearance of the Lord, how the Lord leaves the world. We don't like to hear it. We don't like to discuss it. It's very painful. We don't celebrate the Lord's disappearance. We celebrate the Lord's appearance. We don't celebrate the disappearance. Because these topics are not, it's not pleasing to the devotee. Well, you will see that in the, later on there's a chapter, Arjuna is going to come back from Dwarka. Arjuna did go to Dwarka and he comes back from Dwarka, right? And he comes back from Dwarka with the news of the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty and the disappearance of Lord Krishna from the world. So that's Arjuna's job. He's got that service to do. When he goes there, he goes to Dwarka, he doesn't come, hasn't been back for a long time. Maharaj Yudhisthira is anxious and he sees many ill omens. He sees many signs of inauspiciousness and he's very worried. And then Arjuna comes and Arjuna comes and then he tells Maharaj Yudhisthira the news, what has happened. So that's coming up in this first canto. So disappearance is not something we want to dwell on. We don't talk about it. You don't see it mentioned in any of the Chaitanya Bhagavat or the Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's not something which the devotee wants to hear, really. It's not, it's too painful. It's too painful for us to hear. That's why it's not given. Now, one, one point which comes up is that Vidura instructed Dhritarashtra. Did he instruct Maharaj Yudhisthira? Did he inst because he, Vidura understood, you know, Kali Yuga is coming, you know, you have to go quick. He's telling Dhritarashtra, time is coming, 
very fast, the Kali Yuga is going to come, it will be very inauspicious, you have to understand this time is coming very, you have to move, you have to decide quickly, you have to go now, you can't wait any longer, the time is moving on you, the, your body is already, look how it's, it's already nearly dead, you've got to go quick. But he didn't, why didn't he worry about Yudhisthira? His preaching was really to Dhritarashtra. What about Yudhisthira? He's, he was also illusioned. He was thinking, you know, I'm maintaining my uncle, my aunt, you know, we have a nice kingdom here and the kingdom was flourishing. So why didn't Vidura enlighten also Yudhisthira? Morari Prabhu, what do you say? Yes, Maharaj. I, I want to ask actually the question uh, before that if I can ask, is it possible? Well, you can ask question, but let me finish this point first. You, I just. Vedura, uh, he went uh, to, uh, to see uh, Dhritarashtra and uh, which was residing in the Yudhishthira Palace, uh, with that purpose that he, he will deliver the Dhritarashtra. So this was his purpose for, uh, for going to the, um, to the kingdom of Maharaj Yudhishthira. He, he doesn't want to go there just to meet the old friends and uh, everything. He was concerned uh, mainly for this purpose. And uh, I, I don't remember why he was not directly preaching also to Maharaj Yudhishthira. Okay. Janmashtami Prabhu? Or maybe Chandrika Mataji, you have your hand up. Chandrika? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I was muted. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, the re oh, should I go ahead or? Okay, go ahead, John Mastami. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> he understood that uh, Maharaj Yudhisthira was qualified to be able to deal with the situation on his own because of his level of pure devotion. Yeah, that, that's right. That Maharaj, yeah, yeah, he could understand. Maharaj Yudhisthira can deal with it on his own. He's pure devotee. Any illusion he's in. It's not going to last for very long. And he will quickly adjust when, and it did happen, of course, when news came of the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty and the departure of Lord Krishna. Then the minute he gave up the throne, he put Parikshit on the throne and they all left. The Pandavas left for the Himalayas. So you had a question, Marari Prabhu? situation see that uh, that point when uh, Krishna uh, uh, call us to leave the like home or go for the great purpose and uh, the second part of the question will be what can uh, like prepare us for this uh, point how do we know when it's the proper time to leave home yeah yes well, the, the, you have to consult with your spiritual authorities. You take guidance from spiritual authority. You should be guided by sadhu, shastra and guru. As we said, after 50 you have to prepare. As you get older, you get over 50, what age are you now? Okay, so you've got time. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> you've got some time to get ready. You have to be preparing, but you have, you have to be thinking that in the future I want to, you know, in the future I have to detach myself from family life. And that, it may mean, you know, going to 
another place, it may mean going to live in the temple, it may mean some adjustment in your living. Vanaprastha, you can still stay at home, of course, you can still be, but you give up material responsibilities and you become more uh, absorbed in spiritual practice. Just simply reading and chanting and worshipping the deity. Wife can be there. Wife can be there serving and assisting. Not that you have to uh, give up the wife, but you can still be there. She can still be there. But your focus of attention is on spiritual subject matter. Your focus is on hearing and chanting and worshipping the deity and maybe also doing preaching work, being active. If you're a preacher, then it's very good. You take up more preaching activities and also becoming like a spiritual teacher and giving guidance to people. This very important work. We need many Viduras, right? Just like Vidura came back to be an Acharya, to Dhritarashtra, to guide him. So we need many Viduras. So you have to prepare to you take on more and more of this kind of responsibility. Young people, you know, people junior to you and who you have some relationship with, you guide them, you give them instruction and they develop trust in you and they and have faith in you. So you can give them great benefit. But it shouldn't be abrupt. It shouldn't be, you know, like somebody, oh, I had a row with my wife, I'm going to take sannyas. <laughs> you know, that's not on. Oh, my children are too much trouble, I'm going to leave home. That's not the idea. Okay, any Sachitano, you have a question or a comment? No answer. Chandrika Mariji? Any question? Qu any co Krishna, I have one question. Yes. Uh, why we do celebrate um, Shriva Prabhupada's disappearance day if it's very sad? Yes, we do celebrate the disappearance of the Acharyas, some of the Acharyas, right. But generally, in the disappearance of the Lord, the Supreme Lord, we don't celebrate. You know, we don't celebrate the day Krishna left this world or the day Lord Chaitanya disappeared from the world. We don't observe these dates. But we do for the, Acha the, the Acharyas, Bhakti Siddhanta, Sarasat, Bhakti Vinodai, we do celebrate their appearance, yes, and disappearance. Their disappearance, yeah, it's glorious because they're going back to Godhead. They're, they're going back to their eternal Leela in the spiritual world. And it's good for us to focus on their life, their activities. But it's, it's just the, the practice, it's the etiquette that we don't talk, we don't like to discuss about the, the Lord disappearing and leaving this world. Because it's very painful to the heart of the devotees. Certainly you're right, when Prabhupada left, and like, it, it's also painful to think about that. But we have to, we have to observe that. It, that's our duty as his spiritual children. We have our duty to observe that. Hmm. All right, any other questions? Yes, Janmashtami Prabhu, anything? There's, um, I was once having a conversation with a prominent sannyasi in our movement, and uh, he was married, but had no children for quite a few years. He made a point to me that he was amazed at how much extra time he had after he went separate from his wife. So even when, the, you know, there is, it seemed like, you know, of course, everyone's situation is unique, 
but in his particular situation, he gained a lot more time for serving Krishna. Although, you know, he was already quite renounced. Um, so I thought I'd just throw that point in. But again, every situation is unique, every marriage, you know, and how to go about the Vanaprastha sannyas. Yes. Well, this is the point. In Vanaprastha life, you don't want to be spending a lot of time talking. The wife can be there just as an assistant, but there's not a lot of talking to be done. Some, some talking may be necessary. They can also go to visit holy places, you know, together. They can go to travel to holy places. It, seem, it seems also that um, you know, it's such an important part of the formula for spiritual advancement that we should be rendering service. We hear in chant, but then we also, I guess by helping new devotees, that's one service that senior devotees can offer and please the Lord in that way. Yeah, very important service. As our movement grows, more and more people need to take on this responsibility. More and more people come and they, they, they really want that guidance, they really value it. It means so much to them. It can make the difference to who stays in Krishna consciousness and how long they stay. I know uh, His Holiness Bhakti Vigyan Goswami described about how in Russia they, found, they did a survey, they calculated the average lifespan of a devotee in Russia I think is about eight years. Right? It's not very long, you know, it's such a shame people come and they only, they stay for some time and then go away and drift away, give up Krishna consciousness. So if they have proper shelter and proper guidance then this, this could be avoided. We could keep them in Krishna consciousness because really when we take initiation it's meant for life, that I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. We give people beads, you know, these are your beads for life. I want you to chant on these beads every day, right, for life. The four principles, this is for the rest of the life. So we want to convince people of these things, take the initiation bond and, and, and if they follow for the rest of their life, then certainly Krishna will be very pleased and can deliver them back to Godhead. My sense is that if the, you know, with the um, propag propagation of uh, Shastra courses, many, many devotees now are, have Bhakti Shastri and going on with Bhakti Vaibhava, that this is going to redu reduce the attrition rate tremendously. I, I, that's my sense. You know, first of all, we know from Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, there's one, Prabhupada mentions this in a, uh, chapter 22, Bhagavad Gita. I think it's 1.113, 22.113, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know, I have to check on that. But, you know, how our advancement is dependent upon our faith and the knowledge of Shastra. And the actual advancement means love and attachment for Krishna. So, if we get that solid foundation, it makes a huge difference. That's my sense. You know, then there's much less prone to the attacks of Maya if one is seen to the eyes of Shastra. Yes, definitely, it's a big help. You know. I think if a survey, if a survey, survey were to be done, and part of the formula was part of the one element in the survey was how many of you have taken the Bhakti Shastri course? I think we would see less fall downs amongst those that have done it. Yeah. Yeah, I also found just teaching. I was teaching this, the disciple course for some time. And I think also the disciple course is extremely valuable and I encourage devotees to take that course, not just one time, but to take it a few times and really get to know the content. So the same with the disciple course, uh, with the Bhakti Shastri course. If people take the Bhakti Shastri course, they take it one time. After that, they want to teach it. If they can take up teaching it to others, then it's a, a really, really a learning experience. When you start to teach it yourself, 
then you can really go deep in, into it, you start learning it much more. That's what I have found out anyway, that we, and we do need more and more teachers. Maharaj, can yeah. I ask? Yes, Prabhu, please. Ask one question, maybe which we have not uh, so touched. That the uh, Vidura, uh, he has a realization by which he was able to convince, convince Dhritarashtra. And so, we as preachers, uh, we are sometimes wondering why we are not able to, you know, some convince or. or uh, properly preach to to the audience to be, which we are preaching because maybe our realization is not so deep so they doesn't touch the heart of the person but just the intelligence or you know so if you can speak something about this yes well Srila Prabhupada explains that if we repeat what we have heard from him then that will be potent. If we are repeating the words of our spiritual teachers, if you read something in Prabhupada's books and you repeat that, then that will have spiritual potency because it's an authorized statement. It's coming in parampara. Now, we may not have fully realized it, just like, you know, we may not have fully realized I'm not the body, but to some extent we know I'm not the body, you know, we accept it. We may not have 100% fully realized that, but it, the knowledge is there. And if we repeat that and give that knowledge to others, it can have potency, it can have effect. We're in the parampara, you know, it, it's, it's like electricity, the connection is there, it's charged. And when we repeat the words of the pure devotees, the spiritual potency will be there. It can change the heart of the conditioned soul. Yes, yeah, Srila Prabhupada does mention we should preach according to our realization. So if your realization is simply that the words of my spiritual master are everything and they contain the absolute truth and they have, then you just simply have to repeat the words of your spiritual teacher. Repeat what we heard. That is realization that you're convinced that the words of your spiritual teachers are, are full of all spiritual truth and potency and can change the life of the conditioned souls. So we're repeating that, we're giving these words, we're passing on these words to others. And it can change others' lives also. So, we, we, we find like that, we ourselves may not have fully realized everything, but whatever we're repeating, we've heard it in the tradition, we've heard it through the parampara, and we're just passing it on. And it, it can have effect. If, we're, if we believe in it, and we're convinced it's right, how much we've realized it is another thing, but we're convinced that this is the truth, and what we're saying is really important, then that is what matters. And that can change the life of the conditioned souls. All right? Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? Okay, no. Yes, Haripo. Yes? Permission, may I say a few words, Maharaj? Okay. Uh, Maharaj, I am uh, really very, very uh, grateful uh, to everyone, uh, specifically your good self, because you told me many things which I learned uh, from your uh, teachings uh, regarding how to react uh, to problems of life, uh, like uh, when uh, Arjuna and uh, the unborn Parikshit, they were confronted uh, with Brahmastra. So you, 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 
you gave me very uh, good example of chanting Hare Krishna because in life every day I keep on facing problems and uh, second you equipped me and prepared me for in the best possible way to take up the final examination the most uh, uh, difficult and uh, most not thought of uh, the final and most important examination and then uh, you also uh, told today about the uh, taking guidance from a spiritual master regarding the uh, how we can basically uh, leave our bodies and when to leave our home. So this was just uh, wonderful and quite extraordinary <coughs> because uh, these things we are now not discussed uh, at such a high level in the ordinary or the so-called um, teachings, but this is really highly extraordinary and also uh, with uh, uh, hands folded I request you like if possible, how I can contact you for uh, discussing or maybe bringing up higher level spiritual matters because I uh, I would not like to bother you, but definitely if I have a problem or a question or a query in my spiritual life, definitely I would love to seek your kind spiritual guidance. Oh, okay, yeah, you can get my email, Prabhu. Okay, so how to get the email ID? Uh, oh, you just write down, you have a pen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Maharaj, I'll post it in the group. Okay, you can post in the group. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody needs to want to write to me, you're welcome. So I am so very grateful to you, Maharaj. It was wonderful okay. attending your sessions and uh, all the words which were coming in the lecture form, they were just ecstatic and uh, it was giving a feeling of immense peace and satisfaction and happiness. So I am. Uh, Mentally, I offer my humble obeisances to you, Maharaj. Oh, thank you very much, Prabhu. You're very kind. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in this study of Srimad Bhagavatam. It was very important, very important for me. It's very helpful for me also to refresh my memory, to go over this again. So I wish you all good luck with your study of the Bhakti Vaibhav and hope to see you again in the future. Okay, Srila Prabhupada. Thank you, Maharaj. We from Mayapur Institute, on behalf of Mayapur Institute and on behalf of the students, we thank you a lot from the core of our hearts for taking your time and giving you mercy and blessings by teaching the fourth unit and the third unit. And thanks a lot, Maharaj. Okay, thank you also. Hare Krishna. And looking forward for uh, your association also, Maharaj. Okay, Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Hare Krishna. Okay. Jintin, Jashula.